So materials are all around us. And I'd like you to spend a few seconds thinking of the one material that has had the biggest influence on how our society is today. You might think of uh, material, thank you, uh, like silicon for solar PV or for compute. Or you might think of a molecule like penicillin for healthcare. So please just spend a few seconds thinking about that and then I'll give you my candidate. So here's my candidate. It is zeolite Y and is the basis of the petrochemical industry that has dominated modern society since the mid to uh, late 20th century. Zeolite Y is the basis of the fluid catalytic cracking process and every single molecule of petrol on the planet passes through zeolite Y. Now, of course, the petrochemical industry has been a decidedly uh, mixed blessing. However, I think this illustrates the point that one material can make a transformative difference. Now, zeolite Y is an example of a class of materials called crystalline inorganic materials. So a crystalline material has a regular structure that repeats periodically in space. And an inorganic material is drawn from a chemistry that is not the chemistry of carbon with hydrogen and a small number of other elements. So imagine we're, you know, hundreds or a thousand years into the future. And the same audience is asked the same question. What is the material that made the biggest difference in showing society that we can move beyond fossil fuels? We could get our power in a different way. What would that material be? So again, my answer is that that material would be lithium cobalt oxide. This is the cathode of the lithium ion battery, and it was shown to work by the very brilliant Professor John Goodenough. Lithium cobalt oxide gave us phones, gave us laptops, gave us electric vehicles, and it showed everyone in society we could really live our lives in a different way. Now, like zeolite Y, lithium cobalt oxide is also a crystalline inorganic material. And so perhaps, given their importance, we should consider how we can get better at finding these materials. And that's what my talk today is about. It's about accelerating the discovery of crystalline inorganic materials, materials like zeolite Y and lithium cobalt oxide. So these materials come from exploring the inorganic chemistry of the elements. And the elements are drawn from right across the periodic table. And this makes the challenge of finding those materials intense. So clearly, there is a huge scale of possible choices of elements to combine. And there is a huge range of possible interactions between those elements, possible types of chemical bonding. And if we consider the opportunity there, we can perhaps contrast with biology. Now, biology is fantastically powerful. But actually, it's based on a relatively small number of elements operating in a rather narrow parameter space and using a quite narrow set of bonding interactions. So imagine if we could harness the full potential of the entire periodic table to create function. There's a lot of opportunity there. But of course, the scale and the complexity of finding these materials makes it a daunting challenge. So let's imagine we didn't have zeolite Y and we wanted to invent it. What would we need to do? Well, we start 
from the whole space of chemistry that I've just shown you. And we have to start making some choices. And I'm going to come back to choices throughout the talk. So we have to start making some choices. So the first thing we do is we have to select the elements that we want. So in this case, we have to select hydrogen, silicon, aluminium, and oxygen from all of the different combinations we could choose. That's choosing our chemistry. But that's, of course, not enough. You could, there are lots of possible combinations of those elements. We have to define the composition of zeolite Y. What exact ratios of those elements do we need? So that's a set of atoms. But to even that, that's not enough either. We have to arrange them in space in the right way. So with the composition, we then need to generate the correct structure. And the composition and the structure together then give the function. So in the case of zeolite Y, you have a hydrogen atom in the composition, and it is arranged in space by the structure of zeolite Y to be a very strong acid. It's actually a stronger acid than sulfuric acid. And the structure also has holes or pores in it to allow the long chain hydrocarbons in, the acid centers then crack them into the lighter hydrocarbons that we need to use. And it's that connection between composition, structure, and function that underpins the design of materials. So that is our challenge. So how do we tackle that challenge today? Well, here is an example from our own work. Here is a new materials structure, bismuth-4, oxygen-4, selenium, chlorine-2 is the composition, and the structure is shown on the left-hand side there. And this material has the lowest thermal conductivity of any inorganic material. Its thermal conductivity, and remember this is a sort of dense solid, is only four times higher than that of thin air. It's interesting if you, if you think about it. But how does that arise? Why do we target that? Well, through our understanding of chemical bonding and of crystal structure, we selected those elements because our insight was that this would generate a unique arrangement of chemical environments that would interact in order to generate vibrations within the solid that moved particularly slowly. And it is the motion of vibrations that transmits heat, and it is that combination, that unique combination, previously unseen of chemical bonding, that drives the low thermal conductivity. Now, thermal conductivity is a very consequential thing. So first of all, understanding it demonstrates our understanding of bonding in solids and has been a challenge to scientists since Einstein and Dubai. But also, if you came here on a jet aircraft, you might be interested to know that in your uh, jet engine, that alloy in the blades is actually operating at above its melting point. Right? The gases are hotter than the melting point of the engine. This is, would be concerning if it wasn't for materials with extremely low thermal conductivity that form a thermal barrier coating over the blade and prevent it from melting. So understanding how to generate low thermal conductivity is a very consequential thing. And we can drive those thermal conductivities down by discovering new inorganic materials. So what decisions did we have to make in order to access that material? Well, many, but I'm going to focus on two. The first one is how to choose the chemistry that we studied, those four elements. How to choose them, how to select them from all the options that the periodic table offers. And the second one, then, is having chosen that chemistry, where do you look within that chemical space? 
So even having made that decision of which four things to choose to study, there are a myriad possible combinations to study in the laboratory. And that's perhaps the most important thing for you to take away from this talk. This is all about finding actual materials by chemical synthesis in the laboratory. And given the scale of the challenge, you know, the scientific community, I think, has done sort of respectably well to find all the materials that we rely on today. But really, we're a bit up against it. So unlike biology, we have not had a compound generating machine running efficiently for billions of years exploring biological chemistry. The number of examples we have in our hands compared to the potential size of the space is pretty small. And so although our insight and our understanding can take us so far, there's now a tremendous opportunity to intensify the rate of progress by using digital tools, by working at the interface between physical science and computer science. And I'm going to show you an example of how we have done that, with my colleagues at Liverpool, tackling the second part of the challenge, which is where to look within that compositional space, for example, of bismuth, oxygen, selenium, and chlorine, to target that composition for synthesis. To do that, we have to be able to compare the energy of that composition with all of the other compositions we could make by combining those elements to identify that as a particularly stable one and thus a good target for synthesis in the laboratory. And to do that, we have to tackle the problem of crystal structure prediction. If for a composition, a combination of atoms, we can work out what the most favorable structure, the most favorable arrangement in space of those atoms is, we can compute its energy, the lowest energy for that composition, and compare that energy to all the other compositions, and work out which ones are the most favorable ones to target. So this is the crystal structure prediction problem. It's one of the foundational problems in condensed matter science. And here is how we have been tackling this up until this point. So if you imagine representing the energy of a particular composition as a function of the positions of the atoms. So this is a contour map with the contours representing the energy. So red is high, kind of blue is low, and purple is lowest. And the energy varies as you change how the atoms are positioned in space, and that's represented in two dimensions on the screen. In reality, it's more dimensions, of course, but we're projecting down into two. And what we want to do is find the arrangement of atoms that has that lowest energy. So the way we do it, or have done it up until now, is we explore the space, which is called the potential energy surface of the composition. We explore that surface using a heuristic, which is a clever strategy of building trial structures. So a trial structure might be one of the diamonds that you see on the map. We build it. It has a certain energy. It's maybe not exactly the optimal one that we can get to from that structure. So we do a second step, which is the little black arrow that you see. It's called local optimization. We sort of shimmy the atoms around, and they kind of move into the best position they can get to from our existing structure. And we call that a potential structure of the composition. And then we do that again. We build another structure. That's the red arrow taking us to another diamond. We do the same shimmy. And we keep going with this heuristic model until we run out of compute time. And then we note the lowest energy that we've got and the structure that is associated with that. And we call that the best structure for that composition and the best energy. And these heuristics are tremendously powerful, but they will never fully explore all of the possibilities. 
What we have done by combining discrete and continuous optimization methods is to consider the entire space of possible structures all at once and thereby guarantee that we have identified the lowest energy structure. So it's a complete exploration of the space of possible structures and possible energies for a material rather than a partial exploration of the space, and it offers us guarantees. So we do that by splitting the problem into two parts. The first part considers the entire possible space, but it discretizes the space. So the atoms can't be anywhere in the space. The true space is continuous, of course. They can only sit on a grid of points. And with that assumption, we can guarantee, using a technique called integer programming, to find the lowest energy arrangement. And if we get the discretization right, and there are physical uh, reasoning approaches to tell us how to do that, we can then take this guaranteed global optimum across the whole space, which has been discretized, and then transition to the true continuous space by doing just one local optimization, one shimmy. So the allocation of points in the discrete space takes us directly to that star. That's the lowest energy guaranteed allocation in the discrete space. Then with just one little shake of the atoms, we go right to that purple target, the lowest energy composition. To the, sorry, to the lowest energy structure for that composition, giving us a guaranteed lowest energy based on this com combination of optimization methods. Now, as with any computational chemistry calculation, eventually, if you, your problem becomes too big, you have too many atoms, your grid points are too fine, too finely spaced you will get a combinatorial explosion of possibilities, and you won't be able to do the computation anymore. But because of the way we formulated this problem as a discrete optimization problem first, this is a type of problem called a cubo problem that is particularly well suited to the use of quantum annealers. And so we've shown that you can apply this method of predicting crystal structure prediction to quantum computing platforms, which offer a pathway to overcome this combinatorial explosion challenge. So coming back to the overall problem, finding those crystalline inorganic materials from chemical space. I've shown you in some detail about one key part of the process. It's this identification of the best composition for synthesis by tackling the crystal structure prediction problem. And we do this with a tool that leverages exact physical law to calculate the energies and exact math mathematical optimization algorithms in order to extract those guarantees. But of course, there are many other parts of the problem. We have to be able to choose the chemistry. And we can do that using a machine learning tool that we have built that takes all of the examples that are known of crystalline inorganic materials and allows us to rank candidate chemistries for selection, for investigation by the crystal structure prediction methods that identify the precise compositions for synthesis. And the key point is that those tools all focus on the main goal, which is the synthesis of materials within the laboratory. And so this combination of the variational autoencoder with crystal structure prediction led to a lithium uh, battery material candidate realized in the laboratory. And that's the point I would like to leave you with. 
We have these digital tools at the interface between physical and computer science. They can exploit exact physical law, mathematical algorithms. They can use machine learning, data at scale, giving a statistical perspective. But they provide support to the decisions by the expert materials chemistry researchers who will synthesize those materials that we need in the laboratory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. Do we have time or interest for one question from the audience? We've got a pretty tight schedule to get on to the next talk, but I wanted to open this up. If there's anyone here having heard this very thorough and interesting chat, this is your chance. I've got a lady over there. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm curious if uh, you have some examples of use cases and applications that uh, you can share. Yeah, so I've got, I mean, just slides gone. But if I look at the entire workflow, so we have several examples. So we've, ha we've got examples where we've used the uh, machine learning tool to select chemistry for lithium solid electrolytes that we then use the crystal structure prediction tools to target actual compositions for synthesis. We then realize those materials in the laboratory. We find new structures previously unseen in the databases, and we then show that those materials can act as solid electrolytes in solid state batteries with lithium anodes. So that's one example, but I can show you ones from catalysis for net zero. I can show you ones in the space of thermal conductivity and in other spaces as well. And with the link that you just made with quantum to discreetly look at those things, can you articulate a bit more what does it mean actually in terms of arriving to the final goal? So how do you integrate the capability of quantum with your sliced process and why is it important? Well, so the discrete calculation that we do, the first step of the discrete then continuous is encoded as a problem that is a quadratic, unconstrained binary optimization or cubo problem. And we run that on a classical computer. We solve, we get guaranteed outcomes, and we then pass those outcomes to the local optimizer. Now, because it's a cubo problem, it's well suited to a hardware icing machine like a, like a quantum annealer that can then solve the same problem. And we demonstrated that on a quantum annealer. So of course, we run into all the practical problems about noise and all of these things, but it's a proof of concept that it can be run on a quantum computer. Standing here today, you have a problem. You're better off running it on a classical computer, but we all hope and expect these quantum machines will get better and better. And this approach is ready for those improvements in the quantum hardware. Any other further questions? Yeah, we've got somebody just over here. If you can just keep it brief, if you don't mind, we've got about a minute and a half. Thank you. Hi. Are you going to be commercializing? So just going to businesses, so uh, oil companies or so and so, or manufacturers? Yeah, so we have a range of tools. In my academic laboratory, we focus on finding entirely new classes of crystalline inorganic material because we want to understand what they do. But we also apply those tools with commercial partners to a range of challenges. And the advantage of that is we get all sorts of interesting problems brought to us that obviously, from my background, I never even know are problems. So we're very open to both of these things. And I think it's a very exciting future perspective given the huge unexplored space that we just haven't even started to you know, chip away at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Please join me in giving a big round of applause for that wonderful talk.